Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It does some things well, or at least it did. Could it be good again? In 1974, it was one of the very best in the nation, a time when Albany got things done. In 2010, it is the poster child of governmental dysfunction. It's the New York State Legislature, and joining me to talk about the now proverbial dysfunctional New York State government, more specifically the legislature, are Daniel Feldman and Gerald Benjamin. They've just published a book, Tales from the Sausage Factory, Making Laws in New York State. They know New York State politics and government better than anyone else. They've seen it from both sides now, as practitioners and as students of politics. Their resumes are extensive. Dan Feldman is Associate Professor of Public Management at CUNY's John Jay College. He has served as Special Counsel to New York State Controller DiNapoli and before that Deputy Attorney General. From 1981 to 1998, he was a member of the New York State Assembly representing Brooklyn's 45th District. His previous books include Reforming Government and the Logic of American Government. Jerry Benjamin is Distinguished Professor of Political Science and the Director of the Center for Research, Regional Education, and Outreach at SUNY New Paltz, where he served as dean. He was elected member of the Ulster County Legislature between 1981 and 1993 and served as majority leader. He's written 14 books or monographs, as well as dozens of government reports and scores of articles, both professional and popular. I've had the good fortune to work with Jerry over the last 20 years plus. Welcome, Dan. Welcome, Jerry. Thank Doug, you. it's nice to be here with you. You guys are all over the place. You're doing a road show, great reviews, all kinds of uh, interviews. What's, it been, what's the, been the response to the book? Well, I, I think that people are, are interested. I mean, I, I think they want, to, they want to hear that there's something other than bad news about New York, that there's some prospect for New York, there's some potential for New York. They, they, they're skeptical, but I think they're I, willing to listen. And I am, too. And I read it. <laughs> Dan. Well, well, we've sold over 14 million copies. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. But we won't, we won't talk about that. I got to go uh, after this show for the closing on my new uh, penthouse. Oh, on, right, uh, right, on. right. <laughs> but what, what, what's been the response? Well, Legislative I'm, response, media response? A public response if there well, has been I, one? I just heard the other day that, um, I, I, I don't think I can reveal the source, but certain members of um, uh, certain legislative leaders' staffs um, grit their teeth when they hear about this book. <laughs> uh, not, not all legislators like it. Um, uh, it, it. We didn't pull our punches very much. No. Um, we, both of us are believers in the legislature, but I think both of us believe that uh, there's a lot of room for improvement right now. One and, of the uh, punches you didn't pull was uh, you know, your remarks about Shelley Silver. Mm -hmm. Talk about your relationship with the speaker. Well, look, I don't think I certainly don't think Shelley's a bad man, um, but as I said in the book. Um, he was elected by, a, in a sense, a different constituency than the constituency that elected the speaker when I arrived. That is, when, when I got to Albany in 1981, I was elected in 1980, Democrats had been um, in power for only actually seven years, six, seven mm -hmm. years, because they took the majority in 74. And they came into that majority with a real pet esteem, a lot of pent-up mm -hmm. frustration about all the things they hadn't been able to do when they were in the minority. As a result, when at their first chance to elect new leadership, which was Stanley Fink. I mean, Stanley Steingart had been the minority, right. which had carried over, but when, at their first opportunity, <clears throat> they elected somebody who reflected that, that passion, that mm -hmm. real desire, overriding desire to change things and to promote what they felt to be social justice, economic justice, racial justice. By the time Shelley was elected, they had been in power a much longer period of time. That was, uh, we're talking about 92, I guess, or mm -hmm. so. And by then, um, I'm not saying that they didn't still want to do things, but the balance between um, desire for or passion for accomplishment and protecting perks, privileges, and power, that balance had shifted. 
And so, so the laws of political thermodynamics change. Rather than a body at motion, we're going to have a body at rest. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but certainly um, it was a body at uh, much lower speed, let's okay. say. Um, and the, the way the, the structure of, legislative, of, the, of the governance of that house changed also in that under Fink, um, he, Stanley brought people up, brought people in, to positions of power within the assembly who had radically different vision from his. I mean, uh, I, the examples I usually give are Frank Barbaro, who was right. way to the left of Stanley, and Roger Robach, who was way to the, the right, right of Stanley. And these were people who argued with him publicly. And yet he, I mean, the, the, the policy differences were out in the open, were public, were clear, and yet he, those were his, in his inner circle. And they helped run the legislature. Okay, so those were the good old days. Shelley's right. what? The Shelley, bad new days? Well, go ahead. With Shelley, the people who are who get uh, promoted, who get to be who, even committee chairs, um, are people who, by and large, will not even say something that they're not sure Shelley disagrees with. And the the worst of it, the worst of it is that, um, and and it's I understand it may not be this way now, but when I was there. Um, as opposed to Stanley, who would run a Democratic caucus, our conferences with screaming, yelling, fighting, everybody yelling at each other and, and hashing things out and coming to a conclusion. And? When I, in, in my time there, Shelley would occasionally make an announcement to the press, then come into the conference and tell us what we're going to do. Now, but you folks let it happen. Well, they you know, let it happen. Well, I, you know, I, one of the reasons that I signed the last chapter of this book uh, uh, was that I disagree uh, with, with Dan. Uh, go ahead. But some, we'll talk know, about this collaboration, but go ahead. On this, in, to some measure on this point, for example, I think Silver's run the only functioning political body in Albany in the last uh, two years. Yeah, but the terrain's pretty barren. Well, uh, he also was uh, in opposition to the governor over much of... Uh, certainly uh, dur during the entire Pataki period. He had a Republican uh, Senate. His priorities, and notwithstanding people's misperception, his prior the priorities in the Assembly, policy priorities, are fu fundamentally different or substantially different from, from those in, that were in place in the Senate and mm -hmm. those in the, in the executive. And he was holding ground. He was playing uh, defense. He was doing it very well. He was getting some of the things he wanted. He was building his majority. Uh, now, building the majority as a goal in itself is not uh, I, I would say uh, something that's entirely defensible. You build a majority to do things. But I think that he's been uh, quite effective also in, in uh, holding together a very diverse uh, uh, coalition. And, and we've seen that the leadership skills that are required to do that are not insignificant because the Senate leadership has been unable uh, to hold together a much smaller body, a, a diverse but much smaller group. Yep. So, so uh, now, you know, notwithstanding the and, and and also it's alleged, and I I, I think probably there's some evidence that after the coup attempt against him, he just he changed, and Dan was not the Bragman coup of the mid 90s, 2000, yeah. 2000. So so yeah. so uh, uh, you know, this book is written in Dan's voice, and and it presents uh, substantially presents Dan's point of view, but there are some areas where uh, we had some differences. We'll talk about the collaboration. Let's go to the title and then and, and the cover art. I love the cover art. Now, did you guys have a choice well, in the did. cover art? Jerry had some influence. I love because it. it's great because you've got this sausage maker <laughs> and you've got bags of money. You've got the Ten Commandments and votes, but there are six bags of money and only one well, they, tablet. They, they, without me, there'd be no there'd be there'd be no angel and no uh, devil, but no votes. I mean, the the artist was uh, uh, <laughs> so essentially we've altered the perception of the legislature already by. By altering the cover at the margin. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you're telling you're telling me that the bottom line is follow the money. That's the story. No, we're That's saying that stake. a lot of things are important and money's very important. And, or, and and I would just say by the quantity, most important. Okay. Actually, th in this particular book, and Jerry, Jerry often makes this point, um, money is actually. To be fair, less important in the in the case studies we use in this book. Than Absolutely, yeah. And, and in a sense, right. you almost uh, belie the the right. warning Bismarck's warning uh, warning that laws are like sausages. It's better not seeing them being made. Yeah, we didn't take his advice. You didn't right. take his advice at right. all because you, that's exactly what you do. But the metaphor is really an interesting one. You know, yeah, yeah it's better not to observe certain things. For, for those of you, your audience may not know what we're talking about. This is Otto von Bismarck, who who's, was reputed to have said, anybody who likes sausage or legislation should not watch too closely right. as they're being made. And th that's whose advice we're not taking. So. Okay. Yeah. You guys opened the book with the 2009 Senate craziness coup. 
And it looked like that was the lowest it could go. But there were revelations this week about this, quote unquote, Racino scandal where you've got this charge by the state inspector general that there was bad behavior on the part of the governor, the two Democratic Senate leaders, abdication by Silva. Come on. How could you defend an institution that doesn't allow you to defend it? Well, you well, know, certainly, the, first of all, the... the uh, this is the limbo let me say, to, Let me say uh, Go ahead. a few things. Go ahead. Uh-oh. <laughs> See, we I have to leave, leave now. Go. No. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on, defend yourself. Well, first of all, uh, the allegations of, 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 of misconduct are not limited to the legislature. And, and, the, right. and, and the corruption right. in New York government, the Hevesy case, uh -huh. the, 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 uh, the, the, the governor's impropriety. Oh, absolutely. Are, so so uh, we have a corruption problem in New York. Uh, that is that it manifests in the legislature. We have certain uh, um, history of, in other words, corruption is not new in New York, in New York politics. I was just reading, I went to a lecture on the uh, 1777 Constitution. Not See, a lot of people. Would go, not a lot of people. Life. Not a lot of people. Nice. Would go to such a place. nice. <laughs> My this great friend problem. Don Roper gave this lecture, and, and we learned about the machinations in the early uh, 19th century, the bank lobby. We learned, we know about the machinations of the railroad lobby in the late 19th century, bar, buying and selling legislators. So that's not ma doesn't make corruption right, but it makes it not new. Uh, what we have to do is struggle against it and make our institutions work, and, 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 and we have at times been able to make our institutions work, and, and we have ethics requirements in the, in the state constitution. We, have, we need stronger and better ethics requirements uh, to, to constrain people's behavior, and we need to understand that the political culture, self-advancement in New York is, is, is honorable as long as it's not corrupt. So uh, people uh, sometimes, and unfortunately, uh, cross the line. Sometimes they cross the line in a very... Uh, horrific ways, and, and, and we have to constrain that behavior. But to abandon our democratic institutions because we have experienced corruption over the course of New York history would be an extraordinary uh, abrogation. Okay. What was the purpose of the book? I, let's, let's start with you because it's your book, and then we'll talk about how it became your book as well. Right. What happened is I, I originally wrote the first few drafts, and then, thank goodness, Jerry came in to help me with it. But, um, but I, what prompted me initially was, was several fold. First of all, the life of a legislator, as I experienced it, was really exciting. I mean, you know, fights, passion, excitement, drama, you know, all that stuff. Very often you read books about this and they're boring. Oh. They're painfully well, they're boring. they're written by academic. But well, uh, <laughs> and so I, I thought, gee, you know, if it's, if it's that exciting to live it, why can't, why, for Pete's sake, why can't you write a book that shows that, that it, that's exciting to read? So that was number one. Number two is that I felt that most people have a, more or less a sense of what I call the outside politics. They mm -hmm. understand how, like we were talking about bags of money, you know, <laughs> how contributions or editorials or uh, lobbying or things like that affect the policy process. That people have a gen general sense of that. What they generally don't have is a sense of how the inside politics mm -hmm. of the legislature affects policy. So I wanted to reveal that. Third, I wanted to... This is looking at the sausage-making yeah, process. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and third, I wanted to... Um, really combat the perception, this, this three men in a room perception. Uh, as the book demonstrates, I had the opportunity to, to fight against the leadership of my house and win. Uh, and that's something but, that's, but a rare occurrence. Well, it's rare partly because people don't try okay. it very often. Uh, well, you know? well, what, what, excuse, what explains their gutlessness, if you will? Well, it, I, we, Jerry and I have often talked about the, the risk. We use, we use an academic word, risk aversion. Oh, nice. <laughs> gutless, uh, excuse me. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, we, we call it risk aversion. Okay, right? okay. Um, that is, legislators are tend, and I, I, I would occasionally be, I don't know why I was less risk averse. Maybe I, I, I wasn't as good a politician, I suppose. But uh, I would occasionally be astonished at how some of my colleagues would say, oh, my goodness, I can't do that. I had, you know, three letters opposing it. You know, the, the, the least little opposition terrifies them because the desire for re-election is so overwhelming that any possible perceived threat will sometimes... St now, this is not in, invariable. I mean, I... I so threats are good. If I'm a community organizer, I should threaten in some way well, yeah, you my know, if, you're, if you're a citizen, right. if you're a citizen, <laughs> you, would pro you, you probably will be surprised to learn that if you get, you know, 30 other people to write individual letters to your state assembly member, you'll pro they'll probably do what you want. I mean, th out of a constituency of 120,000 people, 30 letters is a lot. 
you know, on some issue, unless it's, you know, an issue that's absolutely front and center. I mean, right. If it's, you know, uh, abortion, death penalty, there you right. might get more. Right. But on, on, on your normal issue, 30 or 40 letters is, uh, is overwhelming. And so the, there's a, a, a tremendous unwillingness to take risks. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, you know, I think uh, careers are built out from a center in, in, in politics, you know, so you have a core constituency, and over time you're getting mm -hmm. people uh, to know and become loyal to, uh, to you personally. So Dan Feldman stands on subway, stops and shakes people's hands, and he comes to, he, he, he said literally hundreds, maybe thousands of dinners and events, oh. and uh, you become kind of uh, immune from a negative reaction, uh, except in extremists. You can't attack a rent control. Right. You know, there's some, oh, there there's some, there's some yeah. bottom line. Yeah. But uh, but so you, you but 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 there's a not, there's a predisposition not to believe or know this. Right. And that yeah. that's that's the so, barrier. But, that's the barrier. But that's people willful ignorance a lot well, of times. People, you know, sometimes it's protective, but but there's a, a genuinity. It manifests in other ways too, like always seeking an additional party endorsement. Right. You know, even though you don't need an additional party right. endorsement because you haven't got a major party right. opponent. Right. You know, so 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 th there's this kind of a mindset that you're at risk every two years. And in fact, that leads to some accountability, which is not an entirely uh, okay. uh, uh, good, bad thing, but, it, but it, it limits the range of action. When I was a legislator, I was amazed at, at people's at, at my range of action. And I'm also amazed at how little uh, other people understood their rate, range of action because maybe they were fearful or didn't want to lose their seat or they or they weren't attentive or 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 uh, they 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 wanted to protect themselves from expectations. You the know, word so gutless keeps popping well, into you know, my I think mind. There is here. another element. A lot of <laughs> I, I think a lot of elected officials are also have have an eye on you know advancement, mm -hmm. and so they want to get extra parties. They want to annoy nobody, maybe so they can set themselves up for higher office too. Yeah. So. Okay. Let's let's look at the book. I mean, you've got nine chapters, and essentially they address, as I see, three questions: how politics works in New York State in a general sense, mm -hmm. how the legislature operates in a particular sense, and how major policy questions are decided in both the legislature and the courts. And the way you do it is you take four main public safety policy areas, the Organized Crime Control Act, Megan's Law, repeal of the Rockefeller drug laws, and the effort to make gun manufacturers financially right. responsible for the outcomes of their guns. Right. Talk about why you chose those cases and what those cases mean in a general sense. Okay. Well, first I chose them because I knew about them. I right. Well, come right, on. Right. What you know about. I was, you know, centrally involved in those issues. Um, secondly, while I was also involved in non-public safety issues, uh, information privacy, First Amendment issues, and so on and so forth, um, I, I felt that to keep within sort of one public policy area, <coughs> would, you know, controlling one variable would be a better, okay. you know, would, oh, good social uh, science. Go ahead. Uh, would <coughs> you know be a better uh, uh, academic? It would, it would make for easier analysis. Third, um, two of those efforts were generally regarded as liberal, and two were generally regarded yeah. as conservative. Yep. So um, I thought that added an interesting spin sure. to it. <clears throat> and fourth, they, I think each of them enabled us to apply our overall paradigm, which is um, uh, pulling out four strands. Go ahead. That is, uh, as I said earlier, outside politics, inside politics, and then two others, which are somewhat arbitrary, but I think useful, values and law. Uh -huh. um, Clearly, so you, you apply the, each of these four criteria to each issue. of the four cases. Yes, exactly. Go ahead. Right. So, and your conclusions, both of you, go ahead. Conclusions are that really important policy gets made and, 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 and that it can be made. And there are dimensions uh, that you have to be a smart, smart politically and, and smart in, in, in uh, your management of the, uh, of the uh, public discourse on the issue, the, the elevation of the issue in pub to public visibility, the internal dynamics of recruiting support. But you can actually move major policy having to do with uh, 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 criminal justice, you know, evidentiary standards, which was fundamentally important in litigation to DAs, having to do with uh, uh, guns. The, 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 the example I, I, I often uh, uh, choose in these kinds of conversations is uh, not the major effort uh, the the, uh, the uh, to, to use civil uh, liability uh, to constrain gun manufacturers, but Dan's sort of passing page or two comment on getting a bill through that restricted uh, gun possession by people under uh, protection orders, uh -huh. and so 
nobody, no, you know, we're passing uh, uh, 900,000 uh, uh, laws a year. A lot of them are lower visibility actions, and yet here's one that saved lives, and you know that you can take credit for saving uh, lives. And, and so the, this, uh, the discourse that, that suggests that nothing's done, I mean, there's good evidence for, for, for the argument that not a lot's done. The budget's always late, the, everything now is linked to the budget, you know, and, and uh, in addition to, the, uh, to, to, to fights over, over the locus of power, uh, holding up in the institution, making the institution non-functional, but at the same time, even in the last uh, period of time, you know, uh, we had, uh, for example, public authorities uh, reform. Mm -hmm. we, we had uh, uh, rights of, of domestic workers uh, legislation passed. Different legislation passed because Democrats had a majority that, right. that would have passed the Republican. Divorce. So, if so that seemed to be a positive. So, so, so the the point is that things happen, and we need to know that things happen and how things happen in order to be smart and to make things happen. Okay, in a sense, it's the, the Jagger Richards law. You can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you get what you need. Is that what you're telling me? You're a proponent of the Rolling Stones law? Uh, I just realized that I am a great Ro Rolling Stones enthusiast. It just struck me. <laughs> 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 Major problems confronting the legislature now. Well, there's two, uh, two, several different kinds of problems. The the Senate has a very special problem um, with the new the new majority. While we don't know if it'll they'll be uh, right. return to the old majority in a few weeks or not, we'll see. But the 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 Democrats in the Senate, uh, with a few honorable exceptions, are not people who intended to govern. Um, or people, as far as we can tell, who've had any experience in governing. So we don't have competent leadership. Uh, oh, we have incompetent leadership. Go not ahead. Even, not only the leadership, the, the average member. Okay. Uh, the, I mean, again, there are, there are some honorable exceptions, but by and large, this is... Look, there was a reason to be a Republican Assembly member um, throughout the past 30 years, because you might hope to be a Republican senator and have real power. Right. Until recently, it was inconceivable that the Democrats would take control of the Senate. Therefore, why on earth would you be a Democratic state senator? There was no chance you were going to exercise power. And so the, the members of that conference, by and large, are people who didn't intend to and may not have had no interest in governing. And, and one might say that of the governor. Maybe you wouldn't say that. And possibly of the governor as well. Exactly, That's right. because right. of right. his minority status. He never had to exercise any power or responsibility. Right. Now, the Republicans, I would say, both sides, in the, both parties in the, in the Senate, uh, shall we say, did not acquit themselves well when they engaged in a bidding war oh, for God. the services of those four creatures who... Uh, uh, you know, two oh, of but it was great! It was great theater, Dan. Come on, it's wonderful theater. But it was it's Alice in Wonderland. But it's appalling to oh, see no them kidding. trying to outbid each other for the for the support of these people. And so, um, the, the uh, I, you know, you can understand it in a sense. Uh, Dean, uh, my friend Dean Scalis, and he is a friend. But but Dean uh, was on the on the on the cusp of uh, right next to the majority leadership for so long, and just at the last minute, it's taken away from so him. So it's by personal self-interest. And then on the Democratic side, the Democrats said, my goodness, we could actually be the majority. So you, you see what impelled both sides, but it doesn't really excuse it. No. Um, I think Jerry, I think, in the, in the final, you wrote those lines in the final chapter in which you, you talked about um, how it was not even politically uh, wise in the sense that, you know, you, extortion uh, doesn't stop right. once you... Uh, right. And I, right. I, I also... Uh, the, the criticism the, the criticism goes to the Republicans as well as the Democrats mm -hmm. in the Senate. And uh, what's, what's unfortunate, I think the Republican majority is going to uh, be restored and what's going to be the unfortunate in the short term. I don't think it's, there's a long term No, I mean the, the numbers but, but, are but I, but, I, but, I think, but I think that uh, the wrong lesson will be learned. And that, that, that would be what? That, that the Republican tactical position they took, which was don't participate in governing, with these guys, because we can then blame them for not for, for not having not having a, fun, a functioning sure. government, uh, will 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 prove and the, they'll believe that it proved because we don't have the not, we haven't tested what. Forgive me, the null hypothesis. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Do this fast. We don't know what would have happened if they had actually participated in government. They might have been credited for helping govern New York. Okay. So you call, you guys talk about some of the major problems, gerrymandering. Leadership domination. We talked about Shelley Silver and Fink right. earlier in terms of the different styles, but clearly much more dominant now in terms of control of resources, the campaign committees, etc. Right. How do you fix it? 
What I mean, what are the reforms here, folks? I mean, you you well, talk I, about. I think that you have to. I think you have to have a, a fair districting. Not, okay. It's not going to shift uh, power in many districts, but it, it certainly uh, demonstrates that self-interested parties shouldn't be determining the conditions of right. Their own so election. each house doesn't. Determine I think you the should have a, a campaign finance reform. I think the current environment nationally, the Supreme Oof. Court decision, the current. Uh, uh, environment in New York is is a compelling argument for public financing of elections. I think that I call this kind of the heat and light bill of democracy. You, you, you know, you have to you have to pay that bill in order to have democracy or a re representative uh, system. Um, uh, I think that we have to reform how we manage uh, elections. I think we're coming into a situation where our technological change is going to be a, lead to a massive. Unsettlement of the electorate. People going. to, We've returned to the paper ballot, which is an extraordinary. No, no, which is an Absolutely. Extraordinary, oh. Which is an extraordinary uh, 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 kind of retrogression. Oh God! So, 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 so uh, but, but more, more, more uh, compellingly, we have a constitutionally based bipartisan administration, which is essentially a corrupting. Uh, I think a corrupting influence on our electoral process. So those are three ideas. You've got a half a minute. All right. Uh, you know, to some extent, the legislature reflects the people it represents. And some of what has to change, I think, is the public's own attitude. Uh, you know, in any period of American greatness, we have put aside some degree of self-interest toward a common purpose, whether you're talking about uh, the founding or, or the great gener greatest generation or even the New York City fiscal crisis. And when everybody thinks that the benefits they get, whether it's the mortgage interest deduction for homeowners or rent control for tenants, what, what their benefit is fine, but everybody else's benefit, I mean, look at these police and firefighters who get public pensions, how awful. You know, I mean, forgetting 10 years ago uh, what, how heroic they were. I mean, anybody else's benefit is illegitimate. Mine is fine. We need to restore a sense of common purpose. And if we do in the public, that will be reflected in the legislature. So it's POGO. We've yeah. met the enemy and they is us. Thank you. My thanks to Jerry and Dan for being on the show today. See you next week. Gentlemen, wonderful. Great. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.